If you have your Bibles, uh, please turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 12, and then 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 12, and then I'll read 16 through 18 also. Hear now God's holy word. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And then in verse 16, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And this is God's word. Amen. Please be seated. Well, what a great passage this is for us today. A great reminder for all of us as we journey in the Christian life, year by year, month by month, day by day. Some of you were here two springs ago when we actually went over chapter 4, verse 1 through 6 about Paul, the apostles, call for the church to not lose heart during our lives of individual ministry and corporate ministry from the mercy of God. And that he included himself when he said, we do not lose heart. And the gospel is veiled to some and unveiled to others, he says early in the chapter. And although living in Christian ministry and life, it could be difficult often, we should not lose heart. And so in today's passage and verses, verse 7 through 12, he'll continue to remind believers that when Christians are serious about following Christ, there will be opposition. There will be hardships. There will be tension in the flesh every day in daily living. There will be persecution and trials that come about, even if it might not be as intense as Paul's or the other apostles. But friends, in this passage, there's also this enormous encouragement to those that actually belong to Christ in union to him. That God prevails in the believer's heart amidst their troubling circumstances. That God can actually use you and use me. That God can actually use the weak, frail sinner that is saved by grace and that his glory is magnified in the presentation of his power in our weakness in jars of clays or as we'll call it, clay pots. But think about this. There is something innate in our being that wants to be significant. Significant in the eyes of your parents or your friends or your significant other or significant in the eyes of your church or people in your career field. And in a way, perhaps I want to be significant in the eyes of God. And as you grow older, you chase after things that you deem would make you more significant, more valuable, more attractive by common standards, perhaps even more attractive to God himself. I had a a friend over a couple decades ago. He was going to drop everything, his work, his career, to go to Iraq as a missionary for a year or maybe three years. Who who knew? And then he backed out. And I said, "Why, why did you back out after all this time of preparation, raising funds and praying? He said... It dawned on me that I was trying to impress God. My motive was not for winning over hearts to Christ, but it was really to be attractive to God, to gain his love, perhaps even more, to impress him. And so this tempts all of us to try to attract ourselves before our God. And we go on and building up our life resumes, our spiritual uh, resumes, perhaps to gain greater attention. And so certainly the Apostle Paul realizes from the earlier life, from Philippians 3 and other passages, that from a very young age, he was tutored by some of the most brilliant scholars in his day, received what would amount today to probably two PhDs from prestigious learning institutions. Before his miraculous conversion, 
he went on to persecute the church in zeal. Many of you guys know this. But then, of course, Paul was confronted when? On his road, on the road to Damascus, and his life was flipped upside down. He realized that he was chasing after the wrong life, the wrong path, that his identity should no longer be bound up in what he could accomplish or how prestigious he could become and living the old, glamorous, prestigious, religious life. And so he learned in his conversion firsthand the paradox of the Christian life, that God displays the richness of his message of redemption in weak, fragile, humble, empty vessels. That God displays the richness of his message of redemption in weak, fragile, humble, empty vessels. And so Paul declares in this passage today that God, uh, you know, does, can do this in, in any of us. And so if you're following with, with perhaps a helpful outline of the passage, I'm going to have four questions here. The passage addresses the following four questions. Who are we? Number one. Number two, what is this treasure? Number three, what should we expect as we carry this treasure? And finally, how should we carry on? I'll repeat these as we go along. So who are we? Number one, who are we? Please have your Bibles open, including access to verse 1 through 6. Verse 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Who are we? We are simply clay jars in the imagery of Paul, the modern-day Tupperware. Don't we have a lot of those? But even that is a little more valuable. Actually, uh, historians tell us Tupperware is probably a little bit more valuable than the earthenware vessels of the ancient Greco-Roman world. Jars of clay or clay pots, they were so plentiful. It was like ancient paper or plastic plates that you would just use once and toss out. I know some of you guys use it a little bit more than you should. But that's the reason why any archaeologist today that excavates ancient ruins will most likely come across what in the most abundance and frequency? Clay pots, pottery because it was so common in their day. And so Paul addresses the first paradox. We Christians are equipped with the greatest treasure of God, and we'll see again what the treasure actually is in a moment, but the most valuable spiritual thing is actually in us? Broken, empty vessels? is given to common, fragile humans, ordinary clay pots, nothing spectacular? That doesn't make sense at first. Why does God choose weak, fragile, sinful people like us to hold on to this treasure? Well, first, you, like I said, open your Bibles to the whole chapter of 2 Corinthians 4. Look at verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We're, comp we're compared to clay pots because, A, we don't preach ourselves, and then, B, we are servants of Jesus' sake. But abundantly clear in the latter portion of verse 7, what we just read earlier, is the ultimate reason why God chooses weak containers, to show that this all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. What a wonderful reminder in the new year to show that this all-surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. God chose to use ordinary clay pots and jars to contain the treasure of God because when people finally do see the light, they'll be enamored by the light alone and not the otherwise empty vessel that is holding it. If someone comes to me and says, Robin, you know, you've been a pastor for this many years and I think you're just pretty much an ordinary pastor, I will say thank you. That's a, that's a great compliment. I want to be an ordinary person, Christian, pastor, fill in the blank, because I want people to see the all-surpassing power that belongs to God. Paul mentions this theme frequently in his letters. There is no room for boasting about yourself. It is only the Christ. You know, I really enjoyed the story of a man who visited a well-known British church with a very, very famous preacher of the day in the 19th century. And after the service, a member went up to the newcomer and said, well, what did you think of him? What did you think of the great man, this great preacher? And the guest replied, actually, I was so caught up. I, I, I forgot that he was there. I was so caught up, not with the man, but with his Christ. I was so caught up, not with the man, 
but with his Christ. And so when the clay pot principle clicks in your heart, it liberates you not to worry about the vessel, the container, how great you are in this or that, how skilled or gifted you are, but all that is important is the treasure that you hold and that it shines through. And so this is a natural segue to discuss the second point. The first point is who are we? And then the second is what is this treasure that we're talking about? What is the treasure? The treasure, of, of course, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But more specifically, let's use the language found in the passage. If you have your Bibles open, look one verse before in verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What did God give us? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. It's the encountering of Christ in the gospel message of redemption. That God sent his son Jesus to be this mediator, this reconciler, this redeemer. And this particular phrasing is certainly an allusion, as commentators have noted, to Paul's Damascus experience. Where he was literally confronted by the light of Christ. This is what is imparted to each of us at our own regeneration, which is another word to say when we got saved. Paul is saying this gospel is this treasure of all treasures. And so we have a natural obligation as treasure holders to declare it. As the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 2.9, we are a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So to rephrase, what is the treasure? It's the light leading to an intimate knowing and knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Bank on it. If you belong to Christ, it is actually in you. And so let's reiterate the paradox we find in verse 7. God's light, his message, the heralded proclaiming message that we are called to proclaim and, and share to the world is the treasure of all treasures, but it is given to, as one scholar puts it, the apparent worthlessness of the gospel's ministers that we share in all this ministry. Oh, it's put in the apparent worthlessness of the gospel's ministers. For what? For the very reason to show the true power of God. And so this is so important. To be used by God is to recognize that you're just a clay pot. And the message that saves the true treasure is actually deposited in us. And just to illustrate, as a believer, perhaps at any stage of your spiritual maturation process, you'll be encountered with a temptation that it is you that changes things. Pastors are so, and I'll include myself, they're so guilty of this. Oh, it, it is by the power of my own intu uh, intuition my own intellect, my own experience. That's what changes things. That's what changes people. And perhaps some of you here might relate to that. You might think this way from time to time, that it's your personality, your gifting, your way of eloquence and speaking with a non-believer, your ability to be bold to speak about Christ, your ability to do this and that. And of course, those things aren't bad things, of course, but the problem is you'll be so enamored with yourself. You'll be so tempted to want to pat yourself on the back and sit confidently before God, waiting for God to thank you for all that you do for him. But God doesn't need us. He doesn't have to use us. It's a term and a theological category that has been taught here in Sunday school and from the pulpit. It is the theological concept described as the aseity of God. As one scholar writes, the term aseity comes from the Latin phrase a se, meaning from or by oneself. And since God is a se, he does not owe his existence to anything or anyone outside himself, nor does he need anything beyond himself to maintain his existence. Basically, he's saying is God is self-existent, self-sufficient. God doesn't have any needs. And this author continues on, quote, he is not like the idols that depend for their existence on select materials, skilled craftsmen, and ritual offerings. That's Isaiah 40 or Isaiah 44 or Psalm 50, verse 8 through 15. He has no needs at all, Acts chapter 17, verse 25. So, he says, the terms self-contained, self-existent, self-sufficient, and independent are often used as synonyms for a-se, end quote. 
So when you start to grasp the clay pot principle of Paul, you'll start to realize that this is actually all a gift. This is part of the gospel, what God has done for you, not what we do for him. The gospel is what God has done for us, that he has given this great responsibility to us treasure bearers, not because he was short on ideas and he's there in heaven and I just need some help, but that he fundamentally found pleasure in using weak clay pots for his purpose. And so we remember this year, this new year, we remember that the next time you're tempted to think God owes me something, God owes you something for serving him and being used for his glory, remember the aseity of God. He has no needs. And that is precisely why Paul can cry out, it's not about the container. It's truly boasting about Christ, and that's actually all that there's room for. I shared this illustration maybe a couple years ago when I moved into an apartment in Chicago. You know, I trusted my roommates, who were much, much younger than me, uh, it was four of us, to pick the apartment that we were going to church plant around in Chicago in a neighborhood there. And I should have been involved in that process because they picked a place where my room was the size of a closet. And I could barely fit like a twin bed in there, no desk, no anything. And so I had to really strategically say, what is the most important for me to survive and live here in the city, right? All the basic essentials, and, and it, it, that's the image that I get. There's actually no room for anything else. It's only about boasting about Christ is the main thing. And so when you get this, when it saturates your heart, you truly realize that God has made the ordinary life actually extraordinary beyond belief because it is the gift of God, the light of the gospel in us. Amen. Now, if I just left up there, you might think not too shabby, seems good to me. I'm a clay pot and I can live an extraordinary life. But it goes on. If we truly actually live for Christ as clay pots, it's also a very unglamorous life. And that leads to the third question. What should we expect as we carry this treasure? What should we expect as we carry this treasure? Look at verse 8 through 9. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Paul reiterates the weakness and frailty of the servant of Christ, that if you present the truth of God, if you reveal the message of Christ to others and the ministry of Christ and all his entailments, you will suffer in some way, shape, or form. We can't duck this concept if you read through the New Testament from Jesus all the way to the apostles, that truly living for God will bring a life of trial and tension. So the lofty, frivolous teaching of the day, trust in Jesus, you'll make your life better, all your problems will go away, just trust him, just trust him, is simply nonsense in the scope of what following Christ actually looks like from the Bible. Rather to be a jar of clay that holds the treasure of all treasures, and of course to be used by God for his purposes, you'll experience in some way what Paul and the early disciples went through. Maybe not the same type or heightened persecution that they went through, but the oppression against you will be there. The rejection of you and the gospel will certainly be there. And we see this even in our country. It's only going to get, it seems like, it's only going to get worse and worse. More and more rejection in all age groups, in all generations, more and more will reject you and the gospel that you are trying to proclaim. And we all know the life of sacrifice will represent you. The tension and battle between holiness and worldliness will surround you. You will be ridiculed for your faith if you speak up even in a winsome way, which we advocate here at Westminster. You will be mocked for your convictions, perhaps even physically battered and bruised for the sake of the gospel. You won't just have people to deal with, but the principalities, the scriptures say, and the powers of the air and the dark forces that battle against the kingdom of God. It's an unglamorous life. And if you receive the call to believe in Christ, you're accepting his lordship also. And if you're accepting his lordship, you're accepting his discipleship. And if you're accepting his discipleship, you're accepting all of its entailments. And that means a call to even suffering for the sake of the gospel, but also to rejoice in our sufferings. But what does Paul say throughout this chapter? But we do not lose heart. The apostle powerfully says early in this chapter, because here's the beauty of it all, God doesn't delight in our squealing. Sometimes we have an erroneous thought about how God treats us in our suffering. He's not there delighting in our squealing and our suffering. 
but he delights in the fact that he aids us in our treasure bearing and gospel representation. That he never forsakes us in our time of need. In actuality, he, do, he not only doesn't abandon us, he lifts us up and strengthens us, the passage tells us. That's why as we go back to this, Paul can add a rebuttal to every type of opposition and uses, as he frequently does, this military metaphor and imagery. Look at verse 8 and 9. We are afflicted in every way or hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We are pressed on every side, but as one scholar says it, never without an out, never so cornered that we can't move, never so trapped that we have to surrender. God will always provide that way. Or perplexed or bewildered, but never to the point of utter despair. One Greek commentator said the wordplay used in the Greek, the original Greek sentence is more like at a loss, but never totally at a loss. So I think this could relate to all of us. Have you ever felt that way? Where you're trying to serve God, you're trying to follow him, but things are so upside down in your life, it seems, and things get piled on and on and on. You're almost to the point of despair when you realize, wait a second, I'm a child of God. I'm a jar of clay that God's promises prevail over all things and that he went through it all for us and is indeed still with us. As we heard early in the service, God, Emmanuel. So if Paul could say this, certainly we could too. And this is persecuted, which just means chased after viciously, but not to the point of being forsaken and left to fend for our, ourselves. Christ, who his spirit is with us and in you, and finally struck down but not destroyed. It's the image of some of you guys like watching boxing, of being knocked down like a boxer, but never knocked completely out. In boxing, when you're knocked down, how many seconds do you have to get back up? 10. Sometimes in the Christian life, life will be more difficult in certain periods, and the count actually might go higher. Maybe the first five years of your Christian walk, you're like, I've been knocked down a couple times, but I always get back by count two or three, but then decades go on, you say, well, Robin, there's been a point where it's count seven, eight. Some of you might say, I was down for the count nine, but you always will get back up. It's the promise of Scripture backed by the deposit of Christ's death and resurrection. Remember that the next time you're knocked down and you feel alone and battered in your battling of indwelling sin or discouragement from life and topsy-turviness, oh God, I'm actually knocked down. I could read Psalm 30 again. And that my lips will be filled with praise again as I remember that when I'm knocked down, I could still get back up, not because I am so smart or such a gifted, talented Christian, but because God is faithful. So as we remember that he said he will never forsake you and that he resides in you, as scripture says, Christ makes his home in our hearts. He doesn't send us off on a voyage and journey and just say, I, I, I've given you all the instructions you needed. Just sail, sail, sail. I'll be back here cheering you on. No, he is residing in us. We are in union with him every step of the way. Remember that, for you will feel that tension and temptation to run to other things. And, he said, and you think erroneously, God is back at the shoreline and I am left to fend for myself. I, I, I need something, I need something in the world. I need something even in, a, in your significant other or your family or your work or your career or your image or your beauty or your talent or your personality. I, I need to trust in something else because I, my life is topsy-turvy right now. And God is way back at the shoreline. No. I know we all are tempted that way, but say no to that. Again, if we truly carry the treasure of the gospel rightly, we should expect great opposition, suffering even. Because look at verse 10 through 12 then. Always carrying in the body the death. The American Standard Version says dying in the body of the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. That's the next paradox from Paul. We are dying, the metaphor for physical and mental anguish. As we are dying, we are actually living. 
Life is at work in us despite all that wars against us. As we are dying, we're actually living because life is at work in us despite all that wars against us. In verse 11, Christ is revealed noticeable in our life of suffering for the gospel because as we share in the suffering of the dying of Christ, we also display the resurrection of Christ that we also share in. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 about the resurrection life, I want to know the power of the resurrection. And verse 12, the highlight of the paradox, true life is at work in you. Paul says elsewhere, it's the same spirit, the Holy Spirit that raised Christ, oh, is definitely at work in you. Life is at work in you through faith. Life-giving light is at work in you and revealed. It's the example of the early apostles and disciples. They were unlearned, rough-necked, common men, but they were with Jesus, as it says there in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. As noted, Pastor Alistair Begg says, it was not the container that people noticed, but it was the jewel inside that people noticed. He goes on to say, it wasn't the natural ability of man, but it was the supernatural ability of God revealed through them. Friends, every day ministry in Christ isn't meant to be glamorous. It isn't meant to grab people's attention and say, wow, how gifted he or she is. For any Christian, it's hard to gulp down because when, you, when people speak highly of you, you know, it, it's a temptation. But as you grow and as you pursue to be used for him, never forget that we are simply the fragile, common, unspectacular, unglamorous jars of clay. And when we look to ourselves and not to Christ, we can easily fall into saying, well, when I look at myself, I'm looking more, I'm not a clay pot, Robin, I'm a Gucci bag. Like, I look at all my pockets. I can put all these different things and look, look, at, look at how useful and efficient I am. I'm not a meager clay pot. That's not what I signed up for 10 years ago, 10 months ago, 20 years ago. No, I have achieved Gucci status. But then on the flip side, you might be sitting there thinking, sure, there are super gifted and talented people out there, much more than I am, and you think, Oh, if I only was like that, if I only had his gift or her gift, or if only God had put this natural ability, me, ability in me, then I'd do so much more for God's kingdom. Then I'd be the example that others would look up to. Then I might actually be something of significance or worth. But Paul makes the point plain and simple. Christian, it is not you who is to be noticed, but it's precisely the power of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is to be noticed, so be encouraged, because everyone has that if you believe. And so instead of feeling depressed or bitter that you're not like this or that, Paul is urging us to see in utter humility that even though we are fragile, common, ordinary servants, God has chosen us to possess this gospel treasure by his grace alone. So then the passage has helped us answer, who are we? What is the treasure? What should we expect as we carry this treasure? But now, finally, how should we carry on as we conclude today? How should we then carry on? And I'm not going to have time to parse every you know, bit of this passage here, verse 16 through 18, but let me just read this as an encouragement. How should we carry on? Verse 16, so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Some of us feel that more than others. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And finally, 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. God is the power. God provides the strength even amidst our humanity and weakness. So Paul says frequently, that's why we do not lose heart. We fix our eyes on Christ and the hope that he gives. And at the end of the day, it is the power of the gospel to save, but also the power of the gospel to carry us through. The gospel is not just at the beginning. The gospel goes through us continually to the very end when we meet Christ face to face. That is precisely how we should, how we can carry on. And 
it's this is actually not a really easy passage to preach because I know I'm tempted with all these things that float through my mind about wanting life to just be comfortable and casual and not to suffer and that everything in life should just be smooth sailing for here and out. But to remind myself, first in line, oh God, I need your power and strength in my union with the Son, Jesus Christ. Help me to remember that every day. And so I really conclude with just one simple question and application. So do we have the clay pot attitude? Do we say, God, use me as you please, as a throwaway, so long as your treasure is seen. Use me for your glory. I'm just an ordinary clay pot. Or is it, use me, God, true, but only if I can receive this and that, o only if I don't suffer, and only if I enjoy it all the way through. And if that's you, you're not living as a clay pot that is empty, but as an only if type of vessel. So really, I sum it, summarize it by just a clay pot attitude or an only if attitude. That weighty decision needs to be made going forward in your Christian way of living and serving and also at the start of this new year. That's actually a gospel response decision. It's a good litmus test, a gospel response decision in how you respond to the actual God accomplished gospel good news what I mean by that is oh look to Christ as our great model and example of this who left everything so that he could live and die and be uh, uh, buried and resurrected for us who believe in the garden at Gethsemane not my will he says but your will be done not only if but whatever your will is father let it be done you see the clay pot principle is realizing this access to the treasure is all the grace of God. Hopefully you were alluding to that throughout the sermon. In, our, in God choosing us and God using us, this is all by the grace of God. Not, oh, 2023, I need to really work on my clay potness. I have to really work on the exterior and shine it up a little, buffer it up a little bit to be more attractive. But no, to be resolute to say this access to the treasure... This, I, don't, I deserve to be a clay pot that is just tossed away and never to contain anything other than my wretchedness and deserving of hell. But when God flips that, and when it's so misunderstood and so perplexing to the world, this paradox, then we say, oh, it's not about the container, it's about pointing to the grace of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we need to continue to remember, although this won't be glamorous, although momentary afflictions will arise, we realize our reward is actually Christ, and that is simply enough. We realize that he'll never forsake us, even though there are moments where we might feel desperately alone. If you're ever feeling down, go to Psalm 30, go to 2 Corinthians 4, to, to say to one another, brothers and sisters, no matter what in life's journey, in the context of this chapter, may we knew, not lose heart. May we not ever lose heart because this is true. Although we are wasting outwardly away, God is renewing us. God is declaring the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ for his purpose and glory. And may our hearts in this new year say amen and amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you that you chose us out of your plan, out of your love, out of your grace, out of your sheer mercy, not so that we would be showcased in this life, not that we would attract so many people and their attention to us, but to forget us because people will see Christ and so forget the man or the woman that's be so caught up with our Savior, Jesus Christ. May that be our resolute vision and the chief end of man to glorify you, God, forever and to enjoy him, enjoy him, enjoy him, and to recognize this gospel in us is the greatest treasure we could ever receive. 
May we not lose heart as a church. May we not lose heart individually. May we spur one another on to good deeds. May we point each other to Jesus all the days that remain. We thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name.